topic for this morning, if you have not uh, sort of guessed yet, it is entitled The Silence of God. The Silence of God. Earlier this year, uh, around February, a close friend of mine, young guy, 41 years old, married, a beautiful, lovely family, Christians, Adventists, they worship the Lord. They have two young children, a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, a boy and a girl, close friends of mine. In February, he was diagnosed with bowel cancer. He went to the hospital. They found the cancer is spread to his bones, spread to other areas. And uh, we worship a God. We prayed. We expected. We prayed again and we expected again. But there was no healing. And uh, a couple of months later in May, uh, my wife receives a phone call from his wife. And she is telling, she's telling her that uh, the doctors told him that he has four weeks to live. I was in the backyard doing some work and my wife comes to the backyard and, and, and she has tears in her eyes and, and she says, uh, uh, I won't mention her name, she called and she said that uh, the doctor said he has four weeks to live. I'm not a person who is uh, at loss of words many times. If you know me, you know I always talk. Even if I don't know what I'm saying, I, 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 just, I just say something. But uh, that was a time when I was at loss of words. I didn't know what to say. I looked at my wife, she looked at me, she went back in the house. I, I, I paced the backyard, uh, the backyard I was walking backward, forward, not knowing what to do. And I, all what I can do is look up to heaven and said, God, where are you? God, where are you? Are you there? Why aren't you answering our prayers? <coughs> It was a hard time for us. It definitely was a harder time for his wife, for his children, for his parents. It's not easy to see your son going through something like that. And I had uh, once, I was visiting him and, and, and uh, the doctor came and, and, and she says, uh, well, did, did the head uh, doctor, the specialist come and talk to you? And he said, uh, no. And then she was a bit confused and, and she went out, she called him and he came and I, I was just visiting and, and he, he wanted to know who's everyone, the wife, the dad, and uh, looked at me and I said, I'm, I'm just a, a friend. And he asked uh, the family, like, do you want me to share everything while he's here? And I said, I can leave. And his wife said, no, stay. And, and uh, they had done an operation for him, taking the cancer out of his... Uh, Bal, but uh, it had grown up again, grown back, and it blocked him again. And the doctor, pretty much in short, he said, "Look, uh, there's nothing we can do. We can operate again. We'll take it out again, but I cannot guarantee that he will come out of the operation conscious. And if he comes conscious, it will come back again in a few weeks' time, and there's nothing we can do. Uh, again." I had the same experience of loss of words. Nothing but tears wanted to come out, but I didn't want to because everybody was trying to be strong. So when the doctor left, I just went up, kissed him, and I said goodbye, and I walked out, and, and I cried outside. And uh, we had to leave to America. No, we had to leave to Europe, I believe it is. Uh, a few weeks later, he was in the house. Nadir and myself, we went down and visited him. We're still praying, we're still not receiving an answer. He was sitting in his chair, he could hardly move, he could hardly open his mouth, he could hardly breathe. Uh, but he was conscious, he knew we were, th we were there and, and we told him we're going to Europe, we know you're going to pray for us and he just put all his energy to lift his hand up and give us a thumb that yes, he'll be praying for us. That was the last time we saw him. About a... Uh, About a week later, we received an email from my wife that he passed away. So, 
I had a question in my mind. I'm sure many of you go through similar experiences where you have a question in your mind. Why is God silent when we need him? Why is he? And the answer <clears throat> must be someone, not just something. Because the problem uh, of suffering is about someone. Why does he and why doesn't he? The problem is about someone. It's about God rather than just something. To question God's goodness is not just an intellectual question that we ask. It is tears that we shed. It's a little child that is looking in the eyes of his father and asking him why with tears in his eyes. It's not merely a, a, a philosophical why. But it is, it is asked in a context of a relationship. Of a context of a relationship from a, from a son to his father. Why, father, are you silent when I need you? Why are you silent? The question is not why the suffering, why the sickness. We all know why, right? Adam sinned. We live in a sinful world, in a fallen world, and there are consequences. I understand that, Lord. But what I do not understand is why are you silent when I pray for you? So, I could do nothing else but uh, look at the Word of God, try to find an answer. Why? I mean, I wanted a satisfaction for myself. I wanted an assurance for myself. And, and, and I found that. And I, all what I want to do today is give you what I found. It might help you, it might not. I, I don't claim... To have all the answers? I absolutely don't. I have not figured God out yet. And probably I will never do. He is God. I am man. Right? Amen. I know He loves me. I know He's here with me. I know He, he cares about me. But I don't understand every aspect about God. I don't understand every move about God. I don't want... I guess I don't expect to because he's God and I am man. He tells me only what I need to know, right? And we are to be satisfied with that. So the question <coughs> is why? Why is God silent? Why is heaven silent when we are in tears, when we are going through trouble, when we need him? Why is he silent? And the Bible does not give us a direct answer. You, you try to find a, a question about when is the Sabbath, you find a direct answer. You try to find a question, is, uh, should I keep the Sabbath or not? You find a direct question. Is Jesus the Son of God? You find a direct, direct question. Why is God silent? There is no direct question, direct answer. It's not found in the Word of God, direct, spelled out. But through the stories in the Bible, we find answers because you know what the silence of God to me was not the first time that God was silent when people needed him and and what I did is I went through the word of God I went through the Bible and I looked for the times when God was silent seeking to understand why he is silent and that's what I want us to do today we'll go through four stories where God was silent and see what answer is he giving and what assurance and comfort I can get from it. So the first story is the story of Job. Now we'll just read a few verses. We don't have time to go through the whole book of Job. In Job chapter 19, come with me to Job chapter 19, beginning at verse 6. <coughs> In all these stories, you can see the frustrating silence of God. In Job chapter 19, beginning at verse 6. Amen? Amen. Amen. Know now, Job is speaking, know now that God has overthrown me and his net has closed on me. Behold, I cry out violence 
and I'm not answered. I cry aloud, but there is no justice. He has fenced me up, he has fenced up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness in my path. Chapter 23 of the same book, chapter 23 beginning at verse 8. Job, Job is seeking God, he's looking for God. But here we see his words, his frustration. In Job 23 and verse 8, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he does work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. David said, even if I stand up to heaven, thou art there. If I go down to hell, thou art there. If I go here, thou art there. Job is saying, I go to the left, I can't see him. I go forward, I can't find him. I go to the right, he hides himself from me. The frustrating silence of God. He prayed for God, but there was no answer. He looked for God, but he could not find him. <coughs> Why was God silent in this story? We don't have time to go through the whole book, as I just said, but it's important to understand a couple of things. The first thing, it was not God who brought the suffering upon Job, as we all know that, right? God simply allowed Satan to do his work and Satan afflicted Job, but nonetheless, God took the responsibility, right? God told Satan, you have moved me against him to destroy him. God took the responsibility, but it was not God who brought the suffering and, and, and all this disaster upon Job, right? <coughs> That's the first thing we have to keep in mind. And the second thing is, if you are to summarize the words of Job's friend, friends, you know Job's friends came to comfort him supposedly, Job's friends, they, his, their words to Job were this, Job, we know why you're suffering. You are suffering because you have done some sin and God is punishing you for it. You are suffering because you must have done something in the past. You definitely have done something because God would not do that to a righteous man. You did something wrong, Job, and you must find out what it is and confess it. Now we know that is not the case either because God rebuked the friends of Job. So when suffering comes upon you, don't think that God is punishing you. This is not the God we worship, right? This is not the God that we worship. <coughs> but the question still remains, why no answer? Why no answer? So when I was going through this, this uh, trial of mine, this suffering of mine, I, I read the whole book of Job uh, and I'm looking for the answer. And you know, when you get to the end, when God speaks, you say, that's it. You know, he, he's going to spill it out now. He, he's going to say it. But he doesn't. God just doesn't give the answer. His answer, if you are to summarize God's answer to Job, it is in, in, two, in two categories. The first category is God asks Job a series of questions which can summed up with, are you equal to me in intelligence and wisdom? Job, are you equal to God in intelligence and wisdom? Now, the, the, the man is suffering, the man is crying, the man is, is seeking God and can't find him, and God's appear, God appears on the scene and says, Job, tell me something. Are you as wise as me? Are you as intelligent as I am? And the second series of, uh, or, or the, the second uh, category of, of answer God gives him is, he tells him the creator is greater than his greatest creation. No one, not even righteous Job, can tell God how to run the universe. God's wisdom is too great for mortals. So when God finally speaks, when God finally answers Job, when, when, when he, when after Job went through this experience of loss, of suffering, of mockery, of, of, of shame, of anguish, of depression, God gives Job a perspective. He did not give him a full disclosure. He just gave him a perspective. He did not explain to Job why. He didn't tell him why he suffered and he didn't tell him why God did not answer his suffering. He just gave him a perspective. He said, look Job, are you as wise as me? 
obviously not. Can you run the universe better than I can run it? Can you run your own life better than I can run it? The obvious answer to the question is no. God simply told Job, look, you don't understand now. You don't understand what's happening. You just have to trust me. You just have to trust me. As God says elsewhere, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my uh, ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You just have to trust me, Job. You don't understand it. I'm not going to explain it to you. You just have to trust me. If you truly believe that I'm wiser than you, if you truly believe that I can run you, you know, the universe and your life better than you can run it, you just have to trust me. Paul tells us as well in 1 Corinthians 13, for now we see darkly through a glass, but time will come when we'll see him face to face. Now we don't understand everything clearly. Some things do not make sense, but time will come when they will make sense. Now to me, <laughs> well, I still had tears. I mean, <laughs> Lord, I've read the whole book, you know, and it's a long book. And, 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 I was waiting for you to say something and I mean, okay, all right, that I trust you, but I still don't understand. Why are you silent, Lord? Why are you silent? So through Job, God tells us, look, you might go through some experiences, you might go through, through some troubles, through some loss and suffering that might bring you tears. You might cry out for me and I might not intervene. I might be silent. But just trust me. Don't doubt me. Just trust me. All right. Fair enough. We'll trust. Let's look at the next story. Second story is found in Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15. It is the story of the Canaanite woman. Matthew chapter 15. <coughs> Beginning at verse 21. And the Bible tells us, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to, to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word, and his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, Is it not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs? She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed. Now here is a woman coming to Jesus, crying out for help. And Jesus is silent. Now you must understand something. She didn't come and say, Lord, please help me. The disciples jumped up, send her away. And Jesus, and no, 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 no. She was following him for a while. So much so that the disciples got annoyed. You know, if you are the disciple of Jesus and you're walking with Jesus and somebody comes and asks Jesus a question, you're not going to jump and object from the first question, are you? She asked him. He didn't answer. She asked him again. He didn't answer. They're walking and she's asking him and he's silent. And the disciples figured out, all right, we figured it all out. He thinks the way we think. Lord, come on, just send it away. Here is a woman in need of help. She comes to Jesus, she begs him for help and he is silent. I mean, think about it. If you are to walk out the street and you see this rich man walking, he has got plenty of money and there is a beggar next to him begging him for money and, and, and uh, the rich man turns, looks at him, turns around and keeps walking. What would you say about the rich man? He's a selfish, he's arrogant. 
But yet we see in here, Jesus is doing the same thing to the woman. She's following him and she's begging, Lord, please, my daughter. He's silent. Jesus is silent. Now, of course, we all know that the conduct of Jesus did not really reflect the, what he felt towards her. Because later in the story, he turned around and said, Oh, daughter, great is your faith. It was like a sigh of relief from Jesus. Like, I can no longer hold not helping you. But he wanted to, to, to reflect what the disciples were thinking. He wanted to teach them a lesson. And what we get from this story is this. Number one, it was the suffering that brought this, this heathen woman to Jesus. Right? If this woman was not going through suffering, she would not have gone to Jesus. So suffering can be good. Suffering can be good. And the next thing we get from it is Jesus, from this example, we see him saying, look, though I am silent, though the current happenings do not manifest my love for you, though the current happenings might paint me in a bad picture, picture do not judge me according to what's happening. Though I might be silent, though I might come across as if I'm mean, as if I'm not interested, but please, don't judge me yet. Not yet. Just give me time. Because that's, that's how, how the story tells us. Jesus appeared as mean to this woman. But as she gave him time, the story unfolds itself and Jesus shows his love and sympathy to the woman. So God again comes through this story and he, he, he tells me when I was going through the suffering and he tells you as you're going through the suffering, listen son, listen daughter, though my silence now might come across as if I'm not interested, as if I'm indifferent, as if I don't care, but please don't judge me by that. Just trust me and give me time. All right, so that's the second story. Don't let the current happenings paint a bad picture about me. The third story is the story of Lazarus. The story of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Come with me to John chapter 11. Beginning at verse 1. John chapter 11 beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now you and me know what happened. We know the story, right? But I want you to forget about what you know and go back and live where Mary and Martha were living. Their brother is sick. Now, uh, again, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I can assume, only logically, that it's not that, you know, Lazarus woke up with fever and they straight away sent out for Jesus. It doesn't work that way. He's been sick for some time and he's only getting worse. No doubt, Mary and Martha, they're praying for him. They're doing everything, but nothing is happening. They're praying, but there's no answer. There's nothing happening. And then they send out a message to Jesus. Lord, the one whom you love, your friend Lazarus, is sick. They don't even tell him, come, because they know he's going to come. Now, Jesus was not far. He was about 30 kilometers away. One day's journey, he will be there. Yet, silence. They send a message, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait. Silence. They go to sleep, they wake up, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and there is silence. Jesus is silent. They are in agony, they are asking for help, but Jesus is silent. Heaven is silent. Four days later, now just think of this. He's sick. You're agonizing. You're not getting any sleep probably as, as, as his sister. And you're sitting next to him and you're praying and you're waiting for Jesus. But it's silent. He's not coming. You go to sleep. You wake up. He's silent. He's not coming. You're asleep again and your brother dies. 
and you take him and you bury him and Jesus is still silent. He's not coming. Okay, it was time. We just read it verse after verse and it's finished. No, it's not like that. They were waiting, they were agonizing and Jesus is silent. Verse 21 of the same chapter, when Jesus comes, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatsoever you ask from God, God will give you. It's easy for those who die. You know, my friend died. And when he's dead, he's not depressed in his grave. He's not crying in his grave. He's not experiencing the loss in his grave. He's dead. He knows nothing. But the hardness falls upon those who stay behind, upon the friends, upon the wife, upon the parents. Those who stay behind are the ones that go through this suffering, that go through this agony and anguish and tears. And what does Jesus have to say to them? Martha was one of those who came and she looked to Jesus face to face and she spoke to him. What comfort did Jesus give her? He told her in verse 24, uh, in verse 23, your brother will rise again. That's the comfort that Jesus offers to her. Martha said unto him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection in the last days. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yes, it is hard to go through suffering. Yes, it is hard to lose a brother. But don't worry, Martha, your brother is going to rise again. Though he die, yet shall he live. And if he lives and believes in me, he shall not die. Though he die, he shall not die. What Jesus was trying to tell this uh, uh, Martha is that, look, don't worry, Martha. I know you're going through a hard time. I know you lost your brother, but your brother will come back to life. Martha came and she looked Jesus face to face and she asked a question to his face, to his mind, an intellectual question, and Jesus gave her an intellectual answer. Some of us are looking for an intellectual answer and Jesus gives that intellectual answer. I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you will not die. Do not worry. Just trust me. Your brother will come back to life. Your friend will come back to life. But Mary comes on the scene and she asks the same question, verse 32. When Mary comes, she says, she fell at his feet. Notice the difference. She didn't look him in the face. She didn't stand in front of him. She fell at his feet saying, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he deeply, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Some of us are looking for an intellectual answer and Jesus offers this intellectual answer. Don't worry, I am the resurrection and the life and I will raise your brother. But some of us are, 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 are just breaking down, are, 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 just, are just full of tears. We, we're just emotional. We, we, need, we, need, we need the comfort. We, didn't need, we do not need an intellectual answer. We need comfort. And Jesus comes on the scene and he says, I am crying with you. I suffer with those who suffer. Your tears do not go unnoticed. Your tears are drawing my tears. So when you go through hard times, when you, when you go through loss or you're suffering or whatever it is, don't think that Jesus is indifferent. He weeps with those who weeps. You have touched his heart. That's what I see coming from the story. Amen. And then, you know, if you look at the story, Lazarus died during the silence of Jesus. Lazarus died during the silence of Jesus. But this was not the end of the story. I like it how the Bible puts it in John chapter 11, verse 45, 43, sorry, 43. Uh, when Jesus, when they rolled the stone, the Bible says, He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Again, I see in here, Jesus saying, 
Though your friend went down in my silent, I will not be silent forever. Time will come when I will shout and he will come out with my shout. I will not be silent forever. You might be going through suffering and God might be silent. But through this story, God is telling you, I will not be silent forever. Trust me, believe in me and give me time. Time will come when I will shout and you will hear my voice distinct and your friend shall come back to life. So from this story, as an answer to our question, I see God saying, don't let my silence discourage you. Don't let it affect or shake your faith. To the dying, he says, death will not have the last say. I, the life giver, will bring you back to life. To the dying. To those who are alive, who are behind, who, who are suffering, he says, who are seeking an intellectual answer, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, though you die, you will come back to life. I will bring your brother back to life. I will bring your friend back to life with a shout. And to those who are seeking an emotional answer, Jesus says, my tears are flowing out with yours. The Bible tells us that in, their, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted. God is moved with our afflictions, brothers and sisters. He is not indifferent. When he is silent, it does not mean that he is indifferent. He's weeping with those who weep. Just give him time. And the last story, we find it at the cross. The silence of God is found at the cross. And we, we read these words that came off Jesus echoing through the history, through the ages of eternity. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why are you silent when I'm crying out for you? That's Jesus, the author of life, the Son of God himself is asking the same question that I asked, is asking the same question that you ask when you go through trouble. Why, Lord, why are you silent? Why have you forsaken me? That's the question that Jesus himself asked. asked. Out of his mouth came the words, why, Lord, why are you silent? Why have you forsaken me? And the Bible tells us in Luke 23, Luke chapter 23, come with me. To Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 44. The Bible tells us, and it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. God did not forsake his son. God was there. God was right there watching behind the clouds. Why have you forsaken me, Lord? God was silent, but he was there. You cry and you agonize when you are suffering and you ask God, Lord, where are you? Why did you forsake me? Why are you silent? He might remain silent, but he is there. He's right there. You cannot see him, but he is right there. That's what the Word of God reveals to us. So through, the, through these stories, we can see that God's silence is not a silence of neglect or of indifference. God is suffering with us. We might not fully understand now. We might not fully know why God is silent, why He's acting the way He's acting, why He's doing what He's doing. But through the stories we read, we get, we understand that He is very near to us when He is silent, that He is suffering with us when He is silent. He cares about us and He loves us. He knows what is best and wants us to trust Him. Just trust me, Job. You don't understand now. Just trust me. That we are in His hands regardless how bad the situation looks. You might not see beyond the portals of the tomb as Christ did. You might not see the light coming from the other side of the tunnel. You think your problem is going to crush you. There's no coming back. God doesn't care. He's not here. He doesn't intervene. He doesn't care about me. But that's not what the Word of God reveals. His silence is not a sign of indifference. 
Just trust me, he says. Just trust me. And though sometimes he is silent through our suffering, time will come when the silence will be broken and he will shout. And with his shout, those friends, relatives that are buried will come back to life. Those problems that we cannot solve will be solved. When God speaks, our problems will be solved. But we just have to trust Him. We just have to give Him time. We just have to wait for Him. Because I'm not smarter than God. I cannot run my life, I cannot run my friend's life better than God can. And if I truly believe my words, then I just have to trust Him through these times. So brothers and sisters, the answer is not just a word. It is the word. It is a person, not an, an idea, but a person. Clues are abstracts. Persons are concrete. God gives his answer to his silence in a person, in Jesus Christ. Our solution cannot be a mere idea, however true or profound. If all our answers are found in ideas, it is nothing more than like a finger pointing to another finger. Or like you, you, you have hope in hope or faith in faith. Our answer is a person. It is in the person of Jesus Christ. You know, the hurt child does not need an explanation. He needs assurance. And God gives us assurance through his time of silence. He says, look, I will not give you an intellectual answer because you will not un understand. Because my ways are not your ways. But I will give you assurance. I will give you a person. Look at my son. And your assurance is found in him. My silence is not indifferent. And you know, as I, as I went through the Bible, as I read these stories, and I, as I came to this answer, I understood that I do not have a full answer to the silence of God. I, I, I do not have a full intellectual answer to his silence. But I know through the word of God, I have assurance that he is with me, that he is with the family of those who lost their father or their friend. He is with you when you go through that time, through a hard time when God is silent, you're praying for him and he is silent. He is with you, he cares about you and he just wants you to trust him. So I don't know if uh, my personal experience will help you as you go through a similar experience. I hope you don't, but if you do, I hope you remember, I hope you understand that God is not indifferent. His silence is not a silence of neglect. Mm -hmm. Just have to trust Him. Just have to wait for Him. He is there at every step of the way. He is there with us. Amen? Amen. Let us just close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven above, Lord, we know that you are God and we are your creatures. You are our Father and we are your children. And Father, we understand that we, we do not know all your ways. We cannot comprehend all the ways you work in the Lord and all the things that you do. But Father, we thank you for your word and the stories that are found in it. And we thank you for these glimpses of assurance you give us. We thank you, Father, for being much wiser than us and for, for knowing that an intellectual answer will fade away, but an assurance found in a person will never find a way, fade away. Father, I pray that uh, as we go through hard times, as we go through these hopefully rare times, when we pray and you seem to be silent, help us, Lord, to remember that it is not a silence of indifference, but that you are there with us, you care about us, you love us, and time will come when this silence will be broken. Help us to trust you, dear Lord, as we walk through these hard times. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.